1997. For the past 12 years, IBM has been pouring over a billion dollars into this very moment. This is what we call an overload tactic. When Gary Kasparov, one of the best chess players of all time, is playing a best out of six match against Deep Blue, the most intelligent machines humans had built at the time. He, he does not look, he looks disgusted. In fact. This is where the game stands. White, Deep Blue, is pounding at Black's e7 pawn and is planning to invade the position with his rook. Kasparov is close to surrendering his queen, and for the first time in history, a machine is about to beat the chess master. IBM's core business has never been shaming chess players or Jeopardy champions, but this is a little 100-year-old company with 400,000 employees at some point that was caught off guard and beaten at its own game by a team of geeks. So how did this happen, and what does it mean for the future of the tools that you use today? IBM has been around for so long, we have to split them into eras. The IBM company, as we know it today, was a merger between four companies in 1911. That's one year before the Titanic sailed, in case you were wondering. One of those companies, Tabulating Machine Company, had a breakthrough piece of tech that would define computing. This. The most common means of recording original information is through the use of a key punch. You see these boys? This is it. Punch cards defined IBM. It started their tabulating era, where their core business was leasing these tabulating machines to process large amounts of data for accounting or census. If you think about it, that's kind of like a platform as a service. They also made a fair share of money from services and consulting, training people on how to use their, at the time, incredibly complex machines. And this is going to be very important in a moment. In 1952, they introduced the IBM 701, the first commercial scientific computer kicking off their mainframe era. They doubled down on building and supporting these large computers, their peripherals, and again, of course, offering support and consulting to set them up and get them up and running. They transformed computing once again in 1981 with the release of the IBM personal computer, which effectively made computers affordable for smaller businesses and individuals. This is around the time when Apple released their first big hit, the Apple II. And at the time, Apple was this tiny $1 billion company, while IBM was this $40 billion giant. And that tiny dot back there was Microsoft. This was an IBM golden era because they were first and alone at so many things. Their last big hit here was the IBM AT or PC AT, a $6,000 PC, around $18,000 in today's money that had, wait for it, a six megahertz processor, 256 kilobytes of RAM, and a 20 megabyte hard drive. It was just enough to run City Skylines too. No, but really, this thing broke the industry. It was so advanced and so cheap compared to everything else available at the time. So much so that the US and the European governments considered breaking IBM because it was starting to become a monopoly. But this golden era wouldn't last. By the early 90s, their competitors had caught up. Microsoft had DOS or DOS, depending on where you come from, and of course, Windows. Intel, who had learned a lot about making processors by working with IBM, had started to build a business of their own selling processors to other people. Those companies had one focus, operating systems or processors or peripherals, and they were small and lean, but IBM was trying to do everything. It had become a 400,000 employee company and it moved slow like a dinosaur. Their PC business was falling behind and they desperately needed something to put them back on the map. We were trying to prove that it was possible to build a chess machine that could be the best human player in the world. But Deep Blue is playing definitely by itself, as game one showed, on a very, very, very good level. Only two moves after Kasparov sacrifices his queen, he resigns from the match. This was game six in a series that had two draws and one resignation from each side. Retiring meant that Deep Blue won the series, but it wasn't that simple. For years, Kasparov alleged that IBM cheated, that they had brought humans into the mix to make the decisions in this final game, and that's what gave him the edge and the advantage. It's absolutely true that the level happened. He won a rematch, but IBM said no. And immediately after this game, they decided to end the program altogether. Now let's get something out of the way. Deep Blue did its job. It helped save IBM from oblivion. But Deep Blue wasn't AI. To understand the difference, we're going to need an explainer. Imagine Deep Blue as a cook who has memorized every single recipe from thousands of recipe books, more than a human could possibly know. When a combination of ingredients is laid out on the table, the cook knows what ingredients may come next and what potential outcomes could occur by adding a new ingredient. 
And this is how Deep Blue played chess. It understood every possible move because it knew every possible recipe and was able to anticipate because it could weight in all the different possibilities and all the possible outcomes. But Deep Blue wasn't creative. It just followed recipes. And as complex as a game of chess might be, if you can estimate every possible outcome, you can beat even the best player. I have been asked, did Deep Blue cheat more times than I could possibly count? And my honest answer has always been, I don't know. After 20 years of soul searching, revelations and analysis, my answer is now no. Kasparov clearly didn't understand AI back then, but if you don't want to fall behind yourself, you should look into Growth School, our sponsor for today's video. They've created hundreds of workshops across many different tech topics, but just this week, they're offering 1,000 free seats to their usually $500 AI and ChatGPT workshop. This workshop is really a game changer, not just for entrepreneurs, but for non-tech teams, for sales, for marketing, HR, operations, freelancing, and pretty much any other role. The workshop touches on strategies for salary hikes, job hunting strategies, solving big and complex data problems with Excel, personal branding, deep data analysis, and even business strategies. I took the session myself and I can speak to how useful and down to earth the program was for everybody to understand. Over 1 million people have gone through Growth School's sessions and become ChatGPT and AI masters. And this workshop is also supported by leading global investors and recognized as one of LinkedIn's top startups in 2022 and 2023. So don't miss out. You can register now for free if you're one of the first thousand participants to join. Click the link in the description and sign up. In 2005, IBM finally gave up on the business that had given it its golden years, and they would just stop selling PCs altogether. They sold all of their PC business to Lenovo, a Chinese company that co-branded their laptops as IBM for like a year, and then eventually just got rid of it. It's estimated that IBM was making about $20 billion a year from PC sales, but it was a very low margin business, and they were not winning at it at all, especially against major players like Dell or HP. I've heard every one of the arguments, every one of them. But if you decide you're going to move to a different space where there's innovation, therefore you can do unique things and get some premium for that. The PC business wasn't going to be it. One of the company's new focuses was IBM Watson, a new AI system that would prove itself this time by winning a game of Jeopardy. This is 2005. Think about where you were in 2005. So we're going to take a look at YouTube. Here we go. This is the homepage of YouTube.com. No smartphones, barely broadband internet. And these guys were trying to build a computer that would understand a question in natural language, find the answer while not connected to the internet, and answer faster than the other contestants in the form of a question. Watson? What is Sauron? Sauron is right, and that puts you into a time... Today it seems obvious, but it was futuristic at the time, borderline crazy, so much so that for a while, nobody inside IBM wanted to take this project. When they eventually did, they built the first Watson that read all 2011 Wikipedia and a total of about 200 million pages, and they sent it to play Jeopardy. Same category, 1600. Answer, very double. But, but, this IBM Watson also was not real AI. Think of this computer as a sous chef. It not only follows recipes, but it can find the best ingredients. It can suggest precise cooking times and temperatures based on data. It understands which dishes are most popular with clients and external trends. And it was really good at drawing conclusions from tons and tons of data, which is all you need to win at Jeopardy. But it couldn't actually think. This Watson couldn't even understand speech. All the questions were fed by text. It was still a breakthrough and it put IBM back on the map. Loads of companies tried to jump on this Watson train by building chatbots or weather forecasting models, social media campaigns or healthcare diagnosis. But one core problem with this was that it was really, really hard to integrate with it. They had an API all right, but it sucked. Reddit's most upvoted answer as to why says, It is a pile of steaming soft stinky the baby shit. The documentation is a pile of steaming soft stinky baby shit. Just hot outdated garbage that is unstable and undocumented. IBM marketed Watson as some kind of AI solution, and what people got was Python 2.7 on the cloud with a serious lack of features, five-year-old documentation and general crappiness in every way. It's even worse than using 100 percent open source tools with default settings. This Stack Overflow survey put it as the second most hated platform to develop on, right above WordPress, which I'm honestly glad that it takes a win because it really, WordPress really sucks. That's a video for another day. But think about it. When was making their advanced tech tools accessible, easy to use, self-service, part of IBM's business? Remember the punching cards? Nobody knew how to use those machines, so a good chunk of IBM's business was support. 
consulting services. That seems to be the way they designed Watson too. It wasn't just about the software or the servers, it was about justifying their enterprise support teams and billing millions of dollars in consulting fees. Here's IBM's revenue over the last decade or so after the release of Watson. Consulting makes up at the very least 30% of the revenue in that chart, but even other categories like global technology services aren't pure software or infrastructure. They have IT outsourcing services baked into that category. IBM stopped being a tech company, stopped being a hardware company to become this massively large consulting company. IBM needs consultants to explain and show how IBM tech products provide value to businesses. IBM built Watson, all right, it's no minor tech accomplishment. Definitely an inspiration for future technologies, but it built it not as a tool for companies to leverage on their own, but as a hook to get people on their consulting services. And lo and behold, here comes a group of geeks to flip the market on its head. Say what you will about OpenAI, and we have, and will continue to do so, but one of their absolutely key variables or secrets to success was this democratization. Do you remember when ChatGPT came out? Anyone, literally anyone could use it, anyone could test it, make TikToks about it. Their API was simple, it was cheap, it doesn't need a sales team or a marketing team to get in front of developers. It even integrates with no-code tools like Zapier. And so in a matter of weeks, GPT-3, which is unusably stupid now compared to GPT-4, was in everyone's hands. Everyone could see the value and the transformation that it could bring upon us. And we have to get back to the kitchen now. Large language models don't follow recipes. They aren't even sous chefs. They are very much master chefs in the kitchen. Just like the cook, this master chef has studied thousands of recipes, but they also understand one more layer about them compared to the others. They understand ingredients, how they mix with each other, how they can taste different with different cooking techniques. They can adapt, they can innovate, and they can create entirely new recipes based on everything that they already know. And this very analogy of Deep Blue versus modern AI as a member of the kitchen was actually ChatGPT's idea. The whole Ratatouille thing was my addition to it, but does this mean that AI can think? Well, that's a whole other discussion, but still, why is one vastly better than the other? Think of IBM Watson as a team of researchers in a library, a modular system. Each researcher has knowledge about a domain. It understands everything about that domain because programmers have built custom tools for each one of those departments to help them understand it better. So the module that answers questions about healthcare is coded differently than the module that targets, say, legal questions. And to provide an answer, all teams pitch in and an answer is weighted from everybody's knowledge about the topic. The massive innovation behind today's LLMs came from this 2017 paper, Attention is All You Need, which proposed a new approach to neural networks called transformers. I'm not gonna dig that deep into that rabbit hole, but the point is that transformers weigh the importance of different words in a sentence relative to each other, enabling a better understanding of context and relationships. And so the paper was called Attention is All You Need because the attention mechanism enables the model to focus on the most relevant parts of the input improving comprehension and making it much more efficient. All of this to say that thanks to this literal scientific breakthrough, in combination with better processing powers, hi NVIDIA, the magic of this is that we no longer need to divide the knowledge into modules or departments. We no longer need the team of researchers. We now have a single librarian that has basically consumed every word that has ever been written by humans and it can understand all this data simultaneously focusing on the relevant parts and generating responses in milliseconds. Transformers are the backbone of most of the LLMs that we're using today, but not IBM Watson. So Watson isn't only dumber or poorly documented, it pretty much depends on you contracting IBM to help you build stuff with it. While on the other hand, AI is creeping its way into everything precisely because accessing these large language models is so easy and so cheap. There is a real chance that this is a bubble. <laughs> and it has some curious similarities to the dot-com bubble, and we're already working on that video. Still, AI has become a bit of an AWS, Azure, Google Cloud type of thing. It's the API backbone of so much of the software that we use today. Okay, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked now. The point is that IBM had a shot, they had the shot, and they were outrun by, by a startup. Startups can move faster, they don't have to deal with approvals or managers on top of managers. They can just execute, even if it means making mistakes along the way. Where things get honestly very concerning is when the product that they're working on and the mistakes that they can make in that product could, you know, take over the world. 
Now you would think that after this fiasco, IBM is dying. Their revenue is down compared to 2010, but it is slowly recovering. But the stock is doing great. Why? Well, in part because they're profitable, in part because they acquired Red Hat a couple years back and that unlocked a whole new business opportunity for them. But lastly, because they might be the first ones to build a quantum computer. This is it. This, this is a quantum computer. This is a quantum computer. The question is, are we going to be able to use this computer without their consultants? Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch our video on the biggest tech heist in Silicon Valley. The thieves you know of, but who was the victim? Catch you on the next one.